Hey guys, this is Craig Migliaccio from AEC Service Tech, and today what we're going over is the full installation of a Cooper & Hunter inverter type heat pump system. It's also referred to as a ductless system. I'm going to be going over the step-by-step -step installation of this entire system, but it's made up of several components. You have the indoor head unit, and you have the outdoor heat pump. You have the copper tubing, referred to as line set, and then you have the communication wire. We also have the line voltage electricity already ran at this disconnect and we're going to be tying it in from this disconnect to the outdoor unit and this head unit right here is going to be mounted right on the inside of this exterior wall we're going to run the copper tubing outside and we're going to cover that up with downspout just to cover it and now i just want to go ahead and take you in for up close image of each of these tools and supplies used for this installation now we have this outdoor heat pump on a pressure treated deck but if you were to mount that on a exterior wall instead of on a deck, you could use something like this. And you have your, your bracket that comes out and then your, your outdoor heat pump just rests on here and gets bolted in place. So this gets lagged right into the exterior wall. But in this case, once again, we're just going to be placing it on a deck. I'm going to be using each of these tools during this installation. And just so you know, don't get overwhelmed by what each one is right now. I'm going to explain how to use each one and what each one is called when we're using it during the installation. I have all these tools linked in the description section below, as well as the, the mini split. So I have the, the outdoor heat pump, the, the indoor head unit. I have the bracket for the exterior, all linked in the description section below. So you know, this stuff is for the vacuum right here. So that's the, the vacuum once we have the tubing in place. So this is the tubing, we're gonna be cutting that down and we're gonna be reflaring that. We gotta cut the tubing, we have to tighten the tubing into place. We have to make sure our vacuum is good before we allow refrigerant into the tubing. We have this right here to bend the, the copper tubing. We have our PVC cutter right here in order to cut the seal tight. We have our outdoor communication line and this one right here is tray cable and we're going to be uh, basically guarding that with this type of flexible electrical conduit. You could use something like this which is Southwire easy in and it's basically MC wire that's coated with plastic to make it uh, basically you're guarding it and it's for exterior use but in this case we're going to be using seal tight covering over our tray cable you got to remember that this outdoor head unit uh, runs the communication wire to the indoor head unit but it's still going to be high voltage so you have to cover it up we also have our thwn wire right here and we're going to be using this to connect from our electrical disconnect to our outdoor unit we have sealant in order to seal the holes and here's the, the wall bracket for the indoor head unit. So we need to go inside and determine where exactly we're going to mount this and where our hole's going to be for our tubing and electrical lines. So let's go ahead and head inside now. So now we're inside the building and we're going to take a look at this indoor head unit. We have a template for what the back looks like. And so we could use this to help us lay out the wall. But I just want to show you what the back of this looks like. So this is what has to get anchored to the wall. And what you want to think about is where the hole needs to be. Right here is our electrical line. And then right here you have your tubing and your condensate line. So for us, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking this copper tubing and we're going to take it straight out this way. So when we're, when we're faced like this, everything's going to be down low over on this side. So it's going to go straight through the wall. And so you see where that hole is right there. We're going to basically use this as a template and we're going to be mounting this to the wall. So let's go ahead and take a look up on the wall right here. So we're hoping to place this right about here. And you can see how our holes all line up, as you can see with our cardboard. Now I'm only holding this metal up just to kind of show you but basically what we need to do now is determine where our studs are and i'm just going to do kind of like a knocking so right here and right here so let's move this over a little bit what we want to do is we want to get our screws right here or worst case here and then we'll be 16 inch on center, most likely over to here where our studs are inside the wall. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount this plate with thicker screws like this right here. But for now, I am just going to be testing for the wall studs with our small screws. So... I'll just 
just kick this over just a hair more. And let's just try right here. Once again, you can do this without the metal plate, just with the cardboard. So you can see right there we missed, missed the stud. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this down for now. Move this over a little bit. This is all going to be covered up by our indoor mini split unit. So it's not going to matter if we put several holes in the wall. But basically we're just testing where the stud is right now. There it is right there. So we know our stud should be an inch and a half wide. Okay. So it's really, it's from right about here to right about there. Which means 16 inch this way should be where our other stud is. And we can just scratch mark that with our tape measure. So we're into a stud there. So that's where our studs are. So right here and right here. Now let's go ahead and we're going to mount our plate in place. I'm going to grab my cardboard and the metal. And I'm just going to go ahead and put that in here just temporarily with these small little deck screws. And then we'll, we'll level it out. After that I'll remove the cardboard and I'll just have the metal in place and that should be that. So we're going to go up with just a hair more, right about there. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put one screw in right here, and then I'm going to level this. Since the wall studs are 16 inch on center, we should be able to go right into, into these holes right here. We might have to go in a slight angle just to make sure we make it. I might pick this side up just a, just a hair. That's good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put my permanent screws in. So I'll put one down here. Now I'm going to change my bit as well. So these are uh, larger screws. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my cardboard and I'm going to rest it right on these little ledges. And I'm going to bring it over and basically we're going to need to know where to drill this hole at. We could also take a measurement over from this metal over to where our line set needs to come out of the, the back of the indoor head unit. Here's the back of the indoor head unit. And this little clip is where it's going to clip to the middle of that, that metal piece in the bottom. And so you got to remember that all the stuff's coming out here, but when you're taking this and you're putting it onto the wall, that stuff's going to be over on this on this right hand side. So we're going to be bending all of this stuff and have it come out this way. But for now, I just need to go ahead and drill my hole. And so from this tab, which would be the middle of the metal over, it's going to be about five and three quarter inches to where all of this stuff is. And so you can see that's about where the middle of this hole is right here, five and three quarter inches. So that's where we need to drill our hole at. 
And so we can go ahead and just take this right up onto the, uh, onto the wall and drill our hole. So what we did now is we just cut the bottom of those pieces for the cardboard and you see where our hole's at. So just to show you, I wanna make sure that that hole is not below these metal pieces because that will be where our mini split indoor head unit snaps in at. And you can see that our hole is not below that. And what I'll do is I'm just gonna go ahead and So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and put my deck screw in and I just want to see if there's any stud or anything else in the, in the wall right there. Alright, so you see there's nothing in our wall and really this is where our stud is, this is where our stud is. We need to make sure that we have an empty cavity right here and I'm going to go ahead and just before I take my, my hole saw through, I'm going to take my, my probe. And this probe right here is an insulation hanger. You could also get away with a coat hanger, just the straight ends and cutting that and then putting that into the drill. I'm gonna go downhill because I, um, that's where I'm gonna run the line set. I'm gonna run it down, downwards for the condensate, for the line set as far as bending it, for multiple reasons. Now I'm going to go outside and take a look at that. So our probe's in a good location and we have our piece of wood in a level bringing it down to where the mini split is and everything looks to be in line without any issue so I can go back in and drill our hole. So with this probe it's pointed downwards, it's possible it could have shifted to the right or left but we're pretty good where we're at outside. If we were hesitant we could put one more probe straight through to the outside and just check that once again but we are good. I'm going to go ahead and take this probe out of the wall. And now we're going to go ahead and drill our hole. I'm going to go ahead and just go straight in and then I'm going to start angling or maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go in slightly. Let's see here. This arbor, that's no good. You see that drill bit? I got to uh, switch this arbor assembly out. It's wiggling. So now that our drill bit is drilling straight, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go on a slight angle. I just want to make sure that I don't go down lower, lower than that mark. I'm just going to put it on number one. I was going on fast speed. I should be going in low speed. So in this case, we have a little bit of, uh, it looks like eighth inch Lawan behind the, the sheet rock right there. So now I'm gonna go ahead and pull this out and I'm just gonna cut this, this last little bit right here. Before I do that, I'll just go ahead and move this insulation. I don't notice any electrical wires or anything like that, so we're good there. Okay. I temporarily put the PVC in the wall. This is a two inch piece of PVC on the, the angle in which we want to run the line set and the condensate and, and the uh, electrical line. But anyway, you can see on the inside here where we have our probe to the outside, it's right in the middle of this PVC and that's, that's perfect. So I'm gonna go outside and, and drill the hole from the outside inwards now. Now I'm gonna take this probe out. As you can see, it, it may have bent a little bit. I'm gonna go just a hair higher when I, when I drill my hole. I'm going to go forward just to get my, my pilot bit in, but then I'm going to go backwards so I, to make sure that I don't rip up the siding. I'm going to go just a hair higher than this. So what I want to do is I'm just going to go backwards now and okay. I'll 
take that out, and then I can go forward the rest of the way as I go through the plywood here. I've cleared the plastic out of here, and now I'm going to go ahead and fill this part. I'm going to put this on number one. So we're looking pretty good right there. Now I'm going to test it with the PVC. Uh, it looks like I want to just kind of cut a little bit more of an angle on this. should be inside now. I'm going to trace this out and I'm going to trace on the inside and then we'll just cut off the extra. So as you can see I have a line here and I also already traced the line inside. I'm going to cut those out with PVC saw and then I'm going to push this back into place and then I'll be good to go for, for fishing my lines through. So now we have our piece of PVC cut. I filed it already on the inside with our, our round file just to take the edges off so nothing gets caught and ripped when we're fishing our tubing through. So we'll go ahead and put this down in there. It's going to be snug and that's, that's what I want. I want it to be real nice and snug. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a, just a little bead of silicone right around here before we go fishing our tubing through. The whole point of doing this with this PVC is just to have a nice sealed up inner wall because once we put the mini split in place, we're not really going to be able to get the, at this hole again. So you just want it nice and sealed up well. So, so that's the whole point. We don't want any heat loss through the wall or insects crawling through or any issue here at all. So we're also going to put the sealant on the outside out there so it's going to be completely sealed up. Now I'm going to just put one little hole in here and, and put a, a screw in to hold this piece of PVC in place. We don't want it that to be popping out while we're trying to fish our, our lines in. There we go. So now we're prepping the indoor head unit. So this right here on this particular unit just pops right off. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the seal tight connector. We're going to put the seal tight connector in place. And the reason that we are putting our tray cable in our electrical conduit is for when it goes outside, it's going to be exposed. And so if it's exposed, then we need to have it covered, and, and that's why. So this side right here, we're going to be mounting this onto the seal tight right here. There's two ends to this, and these two ends, this one goes to the outside, this goes to the inside. What we're going to do is we're going to, have, we're going to leave these factory connections right here on, and we're going to end up cutting these off just because of the length of this, this tray cable. So we're going to take this length of tray cable right here and we're going to fish it through this seal tight. And in order to do that, I just make sure that the seal tight is all straightened out. And then you can just push the wire right through. Otherwise, you're going to have to run a fish through it. But if you straighten this out, you should be able to just run it right through. After I run it through, I'm going to stick the, the other end right up through the hole and right to the outside. So now we have our wire and our seal tight. And we're going to take our nut, and we're going to slide that over first. Then we're going to take our compression fitting, slide that over next. And then we take our inner piece. And I usually just tighten it by hand as much as I can. And then you can just use maybe channel locks or whatever you have around. In this case, I got it tight. Then we're going to slide it through our electrical connection. All right, 
right, so that's that's ready. Now what we're going to do is we're going to straighten this uh, tubing out first, and then we'll remount this back in place. This is long enough, uh, so while the seal tight was still straight, we made sure we had enough wire to make it to the front of this indoor air handler uh, in order to tie it in. But we can always pull any slack out from outside. But let's go ahead and now, and we're going to straighten this tubing out. So this is a straight section right here, and you see it has this around it just to try to help the copper tubing stay in shape and not kink. But in order to bend this, depends on the type of system. Sometimes you have to bend it straight, then bend it upwards. In this case, you have this uh, section right here that's going to twist as we bend this upwards. So I'm going to grab it down by the 90 section because I don't want that to move, and I just want this, this section right here to twist. So you just want to take your time and make sure that you don't apply pressure in a bad way, which might end up kinking it. And there you have it. So this section right here twisted. I can feel the individual pipes. And they feel fine. So, so now we have these two tubes right here and our condensate line and we're going to put our electrical connection back in. So I'm going to go ahead and fish this through and I'm just going to go ahead and tie it into the front here. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate this. Right here's our electrical compartment. So here's our wire, and you see that there is a clamp right here. So let's go ahead and take this mount off. If you can't see it, I'll, I'll bring it up and, and show you what it looks like. So right there, you can see we're going to put our wire underneath this part right here, but for now I just want to go ahead and get this connected. If we were to look at this wiring diagram, right here it says that red is 1, black is 2, and yellow is 3, and then you have your ground bar. In this case with this wiring right here, we don't have a yellow, but we, can, we have a white. So we're going to take this red wire and we're going to fish it right in here and it looks like we're going to need to back this screw up first. There we go. Now we're in. And then we have our white wire, which will be instead of yellow. So basically, you just need to follow the color scheme, one, two, three, and make the same color scheme out the outdoor unit, one, two, three. Not that big of a deal. So if you get the wires messed up, you just got to remember what color you put on what number, and that's it. It's pretty simple. So now we're going to go ahead and uh, tend to this back. Basically what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to tape all this stuff together and make it slightly smaller than the diameter of the 2 inch PVC pipe. So I already fished this seal tight with the electrical wire right out through the hole. So we're right below the hole and to the side. And what we want to do is we want to just make all of this all bunched up 
And you gotta remember that we need to get it smaller than two inches. So two inches is the inside of a piece of PVC. And so I just typically use electrical tape in order to accomplish that. As you put the electrical tape on, it's gonna go ahead and squish the foam and make it very tight. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do this and I'll show you what this looks like after I'm done. So here you see we have this taped all the way down. Our biggest issue right here, we have our flare nut for the suction line. But otherwise we're pretty good at two inches on all sides. It'll be slightly snug. So let's go ahead and give it a try. If you ever have trouble with the snaps right here, or if you want to take one off, I like to use a, a siding tool like this. It's called a side swiper, and you can come right up in here and pull that down. You could also just take a clothes hanger or insulation hanger and bend it in order to get in there and pull it down. But basically, there's just the two ledges up top, and then you have the two little clips on the bottom that clip into the holes in the metal. So you may have to just shimmy it a little bit from side to side. When you do that, make sure that you have the bottom kind of pulled away from the wall a little bit so it doesn't uh, scrape the wall on either side. So there's usually a little bit of play. You can kind of go from side to side in order to get these to line up and usually you can kind of see them underneath. But this one's, this one's all good. It's not coming off now. You see it's, it's stuck in place. So, so this is all good. So now let's continue on our installation on the outside. Now we're outside. What I did is I cut the electrical tape off and so you know I have blue tape on the end of this vapor line. I took the cap off inside. You always want to make sure that when you're initially inspecting your indoor head unit, which is also referred to as your air handler there, you want to make sure that when you take the cap off that there is nitrogen pressure that does escape and that would signal that you're, you're fine, you don't have any leaks. If you were to unscrew one of your two caps and there was no pressure that came out, no nitrogen, then that would mean that there may be a leak. So you might want to replace that. But in this case, I took this off just to make sure that I could go ahead and fit it through my hole and I put blue tape on it. So now I'm gonna go ahead and bend this tubing downwards. As you can see, that's not gonna be a problem. The seal tight's not gonna be a problem. And we're already on a slight angle downhill with the PVC. You don't wanna come straight out. You wanna be on an angle downwards. So I'm gonna go ahead and start bending it. We also have these springs here and that's also gonna help us and to avoid us from kinking these lines. If I could get my fingers up in there, I would also want to get in there. You want to make sure that when you are bending the copper tube that you don't just grab here and push right in. You want to kind of do it a little at a time and if there's any way to get your bend points uh, in different spots, that's what's going to be beneficial. I like to kind of feel where my, where my tubing is as I'm bending it. All right, we're good there. So there's our tubes. Here's our condensate line and there's our seal tight. That'll all fit in a downspout and that'll cover that and you won't see it after it's all done. Now I'm gonna run my, my copper tubing up to these two flares and I'm gonna do my connection point. We're gonna tighten our vapor line first and as you can see right here, this is half inch and this is 3 eighths. We're gonna be connecting our half inch down to the, the outdoor mini split unit. So we're going to be using the torque value for half inch here, even though that this is 3 8 The flare connection is for half, and right here, our recommended torque value is 25.8. We already have our torque wrench set to that. It's right here. That's the metric side. Here's our, our foot-pound standard side. So we had this stored at zero when we started off, which is down here, just like that. So if we're going to go ahead and tighten it up, up to 25. 25.8 and that's it and then we're going to hold off on this with an adjustable wrench and we're going to use a torque wrench on this this flare nut right here before we get started doing that i just want to go ahead and put some either refrigerant oil or nylog on the flare face so you don't need a whole lot just a little bit you 
You really don't want to get it into the inside. Just on the flare face itself and you don't need it on the threads. In fact, if you put it on the threads, it'll act like a lubricant and you'll over tighten that. So we wanna make sure that we're nice and lined up, which we are. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tighten this until you hear a click. There it is right there. So you can hear that. So that's it. That's as tight as we wanna make it. Now, in these instructions right here, it says to back off and retighten again at say 26.55. We can go ahead and do that. It's not that big of a deal. All right, so that's it. So that's our vapor line. Now we're gonna go ahead and do our small line right here, which is our liquid line. Make sure to get your nylog and put your nylog or refrigerant oil right on that face. So these are factory flares. On the other side, we're gonna to have to cut those and then we're gonna reflare that. So you just wanna make sure that it's, it looks good. Make sure to always check the flare ahead of time. Right here, we're gonna be setting this to 11 pounds and then we can retighten it to 11.8. We're also gonna to have to switch this out right here. So now we switched out the head and we're gonna switch this. This is meters, here is foot pounds. Let's bring this down to 11. You only want to make sure to spin the flare nut and that's it. All right, so there it clicked. The instructions in this manufacturer's literature, which is the Cooper and Hunter mini split, is to loosen this back up and then tighten it down at a slightly higher torque value. So that's it. We're done up here for now, but we're going to come back and we're going to seal up up here. We're going to cover this with insulation, but for now we're going to leave it all open just so we can do our, our leak checking when we do our pressure test after we do our final connections down at the unit. Now we're down at the outdoor unit and I'm going to continue to wind out my line set a little bit. So let's go right about here. Just cut the outer jacket with the, the utility knife and then we can get to the, the copper tubing right here. We're gonna use our tubing cutter. And basically you're just gonna go around every, every rotation. You can just turn it maybe an eighth to a quarter of a turn on the wheel. And that's that. We'll cut our liquid line as well. And that's that. Now we're gonna go ahead and start bending this into place. We're not gonna use a tubing bender for this because it can be a gradual bend. Every time you bend, make sure that you're, you're pushing in a different location on the tubing so that you don't end up with a kink. So 
that looks pretty good right there. Okay, that's good. We'll cut right here. We already have this outdoor unit in position of where we're gonna put it at. However, it's not bolted in with our stainless steel bolts through the pressure treated frame yet. So before we end up flaring this, we're gonna to need to take that flare nut off first, but I can just go ahead and cut this now. And we're gonna basically go in the middle of this flare nut where that is. With our thumb, we can go ahead and mark it with a Sharpie, but in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and apply the tubing cutter right away. that you're going to want to hold the quarter inch line in the same location as the vapor line sometimes it's a little easier to just go ahead and do the whole flare connection first and then you can always uh, Take care of the second flare connection afterwards. So right there. We're also going to go ahead and ream it and you always want to do this with the tubing face downwards. I usually do not use a stick reamer. I only use a round reamer for this for when I'm doing my flaring. I want to make sure that I don't scar the inner walls where my flare face is going to be. So that's why I just use my round reamer. So we're ready to go there. I'm going to take these tubes, put these out of the way for a sec. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these flare nuts off. We're going to take our adjustable wrench. We'll loosen up these flare nuts. So we're going to leave these flare nuts in plain sight so we don't forget about them. We're going to take care of this half inch line first. We're just going to check it again, make sure that we're in the right spot, right where we want it at. Yep. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this flare nut on and we're going to take our flaring tool right here. This is an eccentric flaring tool and inside let me just show you what this looks like on the inside of here this rotates and it only applies force on one side of the copper tubing at a time we're going to put nylog right on the uh, the flare cone of this tool and once again this is an eccentric flaring tool and we have all of our tools that we're using in this video linked in the description section below as well as our equipment here so we just take a little bit of nylog right there we're going to put that right onto the cone and this way, there's no, the copper tubing won't scar up the cone. It'll make a nice, smooth surface. We'll get the excess off as well. You don't have to take this off. I just was doing that just to show you. All right, so it's just like that. Now, we're going to be using the half-inch OD. So that's the copper tubing size. A lot of times we're using 3 8 OD. But in this case, we're looking at half-inch. When we do this, we want to make sure that our copper tubing is out, out of the flare block. So this is the flare block, and we want to make sure it's at least about an eighth of an inch past, past the block on this side. There's some tools that have an uh, automatic guide 
but I like to make mine just a little bit bigger. And once again, make sure that you remember the flare knot. That's a uh, pretty important. And it's pretty simple. You're just going to go ahead and turn this. I don't know if there's any way for you to be able to see that. You're going to turn this until it clicks and you're going to see that this gap right here is going to be opening up and then you'll hear a click. And that's it. And you back it up. Slide this back. And then we have our flare. I'm gonna show you an up close view of this. So here you see the flare and the flare takes up the entire inside diameter of the flare nut. So that's good. You don't see any scratches on that flare at all. And so, so that's good, ready to go. Like I mentioned before, sometimes you wanna get this in place and then put the other one in, but just for the sake of uh, for this video and so you can see it clearly, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and take care of this one now. We're gonna put the flare nut on. I'm not gonna get that on until I get this ready. So we see quarter inches right here. So we always want to make sure that the, the tubing is deburred first. Make sure that the copper tube is about an eighth of an inch past the block. And this right here will line up right into one of these little holes one of these little notches that's cut in here. And so it'll line up real good. And once again, you just come right in. And that's it. Pretty easy tool to use. It's just, you just gotta know to hold the copper tube an eighth of an inch past the block, that's all. This is my preferred flaring tool makes really nice flares. You can see that we're taking up the, the full surface area of the flare. I'll take you in for an up close image of this one. So here's the inside of the flare. There's no scratches and it's taking up the, uh, the full area within the flare nut. So that flare is good. Now we're gonna need our torque wrench and we have our two sizes that we need right here. You can see with a tool like this, you have your foot pound and metric right here. And so it says the, the tubing size flare nut wrench size so that's what i'm working with right here i already know which sizes i need so i'm going to move this case out of the way we're going to go ahead and put nylog on the flare face of both flares and both connections and then we'll go ahead and torque these in place as well we need to be aware of our half inch flare we're going to torque it down at 25.8 then we're going to loosen it up just a little bit and then we're going to tighten it down to 26.5. Once again, that's the installation instructions found right here of this Cooper and Hunter manufacturer. So here's our nylog. We don't need a whole lot. You want to make sure to not get it into the inside of the tubing, just on the flare face itself, not on the threads. Otherwise, it's a possibility of over tightening them. This is going to help the, the flare joint seal up. So when you do a flare, you want to make sure to just get your nut all the way forward. And this way, the flare face is not getting scratched as you're doing your preliminary tightening. whatever reason we're binding up right now there we go all 
Our torque wrench right now is set at all the way at nothing. So we're gonna go ahead and crank that up to, this is the metric side. We'll look at the foot pound side, the 25.8. If there's something to hold on to here, you can also do that. In this case, there's really not much to hold on to. These two bolts should keep it in place. Now we're waiting for our click. So that's that. Now we're going to back this up just a little bit. We're going to tighten this. So that's it. To switch out the head, we just press this in. And now that head's in place. We're going to reduce this down to 11, 11 foot pounds. And that's stated right here, quarter inch, 11 pounds. And then it says, uh, so you use a torque wrench to tighten the flare nut according to the torque values in the torque requirements table below, then loosen the flaring nut slightly, then tighten again. When we tighten it again, we're gonna tighten it at 11.8. Now you hear the birds singing just because I'm talking. <laughs> we're outside, that's, it is what it is. So we're at 11 right now. So you just heard it click. Now we're gonna tighten this up a little bit. 11.8. So that time we didn't loosen it. We can go ahead and loosen it. My apologies. We're at 11.8, we'll just go just a hair higher. If you keep turning and turning, and the tool does not click, then, then you really need to stop. You need to check your, your torque wrench, make sure it's working properly, because it's easy to, to possibly like de-thread this by over tightening. And that's especially true if you were to accidentally add some lubricant on the flares, you don't want to do that. But right now we are uh, tightened in place. So we're good to go here. Now we're going to do our nitrogen pressure test. And here's our nitrogen bottle. Here's our regulator. We're going to use a compound manifold gauge set for our pressure test. Maybe that's the only type that you have. So that's what we'll, we'll do. But for a pressure test, the best one to use is a digital manifold set because you will see the incremental changes in a pressure drop. If there is any loss in pressure, you're gonna be able to see it real quick right here. So uh, if you use the digital manifold gauge set, you could do this in about 10 minutes. You could just let the pressure sit in here for 10 minutes to see if it falls. If you're using a compound set, you're gonna use it for maybe about half an hour to an hour. And you might wanna tap on the gauge as well to see if the needle falls and if there is a leak. You're also gonna need a 5 16 to quarter inch adapter. And that's because this port right here is 5 16 And there is a valve core on the inside, otherwise known as a Schrader valve. And there's also a Schrader valve in here and a valve core depressor. So we're just gonna go ahead and screw that in. So even if there was pressure in here, which there's not, the tube is empty, this extra valve core right here would hold in the pressure. But anyway, this is uh, uh, what we're gonna be using for this instance. You could use a valve core removal tool and just remove that valve core out of here for during the pressure test, that's fine as well. We're gonna mount our blue low side hose to the vapor line now. We also wanna make sure that our handles are shut and the hoses are snug before we go ahead and do our final connection right here. Then we're gonna make sure that our nitrogen's at zero. We're gonna go ahead and connect our yellow service hose. Make sure your thumb screw is backed out before you open the nitrogen bottle. Otherwise, you're gonna have pressure immediately go from here into here. So we'll open this up and you see our pressure is about a little over 1,000, maybe it's 1,050. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and put this up. We're gonna pressure test this up to 
right about 300 psi. I typically pressure test a mini split or ductless system at about 300 psi, uh, regardless of of the system. So the whole point is that you can just let the pressure test sit on here longer. You don't want to over pressurize the system, and especially that's especially true in the case of an older system. You don't want to pressure pressure test that too high. So we're right about 300 PSI right now. We're just gonna go ahead and tap on the gauge and we can take this pressure off right here. We're a little bit lower than 300, about 298. So we're gonna go ahead and just let this sit on here for about 20, 30 minutes and we'll go ahead and see if the uh, nitrogen pressure has fallen. During the pressure test, you can check for bubbles and that would indicate that there's a leak at the flare. If you have, once again, a digital manifold set, you can just see the pressure drop and that would signal that you have a leak. But this is just something that you can do right away in case you, know, in case you uh, just are concerned that you might have a leak at a flare. But we saw that both of these flare faces are good, so we should have no problem here. And then we can also take our bubble leak detector up high and check that those two joints as well. Just so you know, this is an anti-corrosive bubble leak detector, so it's not going to, to hurt the copper tubing. You don't want to use dish soap and water, because that could eat away at this even after you wipe it off. But right now you see that there is no bubbles, there's no fo foaming action, so we know that there's no leaks right here. All right, our pressure test has held. We're right at about 30 minutes. I'm just going to go ahead and tap it again so you can see our needle is not falling. So, so we are good. We also did put some bubble leak detector on both sets of, of joints, so everything's fine. And what we're going to do is we're going to shut our valve here, disconnect. And then we can just go ahead and let our pressure out. You want to make sure to not shoot the valve core depressor out when you're releasing the pressure. Just be careful of that. And we can also... This, this handle is going to be shut. It's shut now. And then we can release the pressure out of our nitrogen tank as well. So that's that. And we'll back that thumb screw out again. And we can go ahead and disconnect over here. And we're going to set our, our vacuum up. Now we're going to do our vacuum procedure. And these are valve core removal tools. This is a 5 16 valve core removal tool. So that will fit on that port. This one is only a quarter inch. So it won't fit. The thing is... This 5 16 is only up here. This is quarter inch and this is quarter inch in the back. So you can actually attach any of the other hoses or the vacuum gauge onto this without a problem. Now we don't have to install this on here quite yet. We can just go ahead and pull the valve core out because there is no pressure right now on the inside of this tube. So what I like to do is I like to just leave that right on there and I'll set that to the side. So we just pulled our valve core out. And what I typically do is I use two valve core removal tools. One is to be able to use this vacuum rated valve right here to valve off the, the vacuum gauge. So if, if the vacuum gauge is mounted right here, then with this valve off, we can measure the vacuum with the vacuum pump off. So what I typically do, I also put a second valve core removal tool here and the reason for that is just to protect my vacuum gauge. And it's protecting it from any oil getting up into the vacuum sensor. So I'm just going to go ahead and mount that right here. You'll see what I mean by that as we move forward. So vacuum gauge, valve core removal tools. These are all linked in the description section below as well as the outdoor heat pump and the indoor head unit. So that's all attached, ready to go. Now we can choose uh, which hose to, to connect the vacuum pump to this port right here with and you can use just a standard quarter inch hose i would not use one with a valve on it because the ones with the valve are not vacuum rated so i just use a standard hose and make sure that there is no valve core depressor on the inside that would also restrict the flow so the whole reason that we are removing the valve core is to remove the restriction here so we're going to be able to get a nice deep vacuum on this system it's going to be able to get done fairly quickly as well so we could use this in this case we're going to use a 
a larger hose and basically it's it's three eighths on the top this this vacuum pump i really like this one uh, made by cps and you see that you have several vacuum fittings that you can use so i just go ahead and tighten that down And so we're going from 3 8 right here to quarter inch. You could also put a little bit of refrigerant oil or nylog on the, the O-ring in here, or actually the gasket in here, or the gasket and the hose. I usually just have a little little bit of refrigerant oil on them. You don't have to put it on every single time you do a vacuum, but it just helps with sealing all this stuff up. I don't know if this hose is in your shot or not. But now we're ready to go ahead and do our vacuum. And after we pull the vacuum down to 500 microns, and the whole point of the vacuum is that we can uh, remove the moisture, remove the air, nitrogen out of the system, and we're getting it ready for the, the refrigerant from inside the system to enter into the tubing. So when we pull the vacuum down below 500 microns and we're able to hold 500 microns after the vacuum pump is off, that's when we know that we have no, no water, no leaks, no air. We already know that we don't have any leaks because we did a nitrogen pressure test ahead of time. And in order to break the vacuum, we're going to need an Allen wrench. So I have one right on my, my ratchet set right here. You can use a standard Allen key. Most of the time on mini splits are standard uh, two size ratcheting service wrench adapter doesn't quite fit in there. So you don't want to strip out the, the, the fitting. So we're just going to use this one right here, which is the correct size. So now, now we're ready to go. We'll turn our vacuum gauge on and we're going to change the units to microns but you can see it in inch hg or a, a many different values on this gauge uh, but we're just going to set that to, to microns so we'll see here so now we're on microns we'll turn our vacuum pump on as well there may be air trapped within the valve right here so as we do with the vacuum we might you might see me just turn this off and turn it back on and that's the only reason that we're doing that, is just to make sure that we don't have any air trapped right here in the actual valve. So it's going to start off in the thousands. We just got to get down to a readable level first. And we should be coming up on that, on that level fairly soon. But there really is no problem with doing a, a fast vacuum with the mini split, especially you know when you have heat in the building and, and it's not below freezing outside it's you should be able to do a vacuum fairly quickly we should be uh, registering pretty soon we checked all these fittings and made sure that they were tight ahead of time so we should be good there we are good here and these caps are good as well now we're pulling down so you can see the vacuum level lowering and once again you don't have to have two valve core removal tools you can just have one but i like to have two just so i can valve off my vacuum gauge right before we we break the vacuum with refrigerant from the inside of the system so i just want to make sure that we get any air you see that we just introduced air into the system right here from that valve Now we'll go ahead and shut this off and we'll see if the vacuum level rises up above 500 microns. We would do a standing vacuum test for about 10 minutes, so we'll see if this rises. During this 10 minute standing vacuum test, I just wanted to go over that we have tons of free resources for HVACR technicians over at our website at acservicetech.com. 
We've got articles that I wrote, which are say three, four or five pages long with a lot of custom images in them. So we spend a lot of time answering questions in article form. We also have a bunch of different podcasts available that we're answering people's questions. So technicians ask a lot of questions on our, our YouTube channel and in the email. And so we take the time during the podcast to answer some of those questions. We also have quizzes that get answered automatically on our website. And so you can see how well you do, how much knowledge you have, and some are checking the refrigerant charge or electrical troubleshooting and, and multimeter use. We also have some Q&A at the website. So we go over some of the common questions that are asked. I also go over how I got started in the field. So we have question and answers on that. We also have HVAC calculators on the website as well. So whether you're trying to find target superheat of a standard split system unit or whether you're trying to determine refrigerant weights for weighing in refrigerant into a system that's off and evacuated. So we have all of those different calculators over at the website. Make sure to check out our book, The Refrigerant Charging and Service Procedures for Air Conditioning. In that book, we go over the preparation of a system for refrigerant, checking the refrigerant charge, and also troubleshooting. The full outline and sample pages for that book are available over at acservicetech.com slash ac dash book. Also make sure to check out our thousand question workbook and we have an answer key available for that. So that's a self-study guide so you can learn more about HVACR and test your own knowledge. You can also check that yourself. Now that answer key is removable. So you could hand that workbook over to your apprentice and then you could just keep the answer key and then maybe check their answers. Also make sure to check out our quick reference cards which we have available over at our website and also at Amazon. So all of our physical products are available at our website and on Amazon. And our ebook is available at our website and also on Google Play. We also have a video list of 75 videos that correlate to different page numbers in the book. We also have over 400 HVACR training videos that are anywhere from say 5 minutes to 15 minutes long. Those are all just free to check out. And we also have a tool list at our website. So we, all the different tools, whether they're electronic tools or, or leak detection tools or electrical troubleshooting tools, we also have videos in each category of those tools at our website. So make sure to check all those out over at acservicetech.com. Now let's get back to this installation. So there we have it. There's our 10 minute standing vacuum test. We see that the vacuum level rose to 430, but it did not continue to just keep rising, rising, rising. Also, when the vacuum gauge shuts off and when you turn it back on, it always tends to read 20 microns higher for some reason, but it, it's always been pretty accurate for me. Uh, so 430 microns, so we know that there's no air, there's no nitrogen, there's no leaks, there's no water in that system. So we're good to go, and we can go ahead and release the refrigerant from this system into the lines. So we're just going to go ahead and get that in there like that, and I'm going to shut this off. We can continue opening that up, but I'm going to first open this one up. You don't have to force it once it gets all the way back. There's an O-ring that seals it up on the inside. So you don't have to, you don't want to force it at the end. It's not like a three position service valve. So that's it. Now we can go ahead and disconnect right here, but we're going to need to reinsert our valve core. Since this is turned off, we can just go ahead and remove the vacuum gauge. We can remove this hose right here. Now we're going to put the valve core back in, and in order to do this, we're going to loosen this connection up just a little bit because the gasket is squished right now, and we want to get that valve core back in. So we're going to put this in here. We're going to purge, purge a little bit of air right here. There we go. And we're just gonna loosen this up just a little bit. We don't wanna loosen up too much, but see, you now have a little bit of play. You have to press in on this 
as you turn in order to get that valve core to seat back in the port. Now we're going to put this cap on and it has a hole in it and we'll just put this right here on the end. And we can test to see if there is any leak at the, the valve core. Now we're actually going to attach our gauge set to this in order to check. So we really don't need to do this right now. We'll do this afterwards. I just wanted to show you just in case you were to get to this point and you weren't going to attach your gauge set to it. That's what you do and there is no bubbles forming. There's no glistening. So we are good to go to remove this. We can put our caps back on now. At this point, we're going to switch gears and we're going to wire in our outdoor disconnect and we're going to also attach our communication electrical lines. We're going to be putting our connectors in right here. So if we dry fit this in place, we're going to see that we're, we're going to need to cut it right about here. Now we have the wire inside, so we want to make sure not to cut the wire. So we're just going to scar the outside and then we can just Bend it like that. And then we can just put this knife underneath of it. And that's that. So we'll pull this all off. And we'll just give ourselves a little extra right here for now. We'll also take this cover off. And we're going to take our seal tight connector. So we have our, our conduit protecting our high voltage lines going from the inside from the outside unit to the inside unit. You got to remember that this outdoor unit is the one that has the high voltage power from the disconnect, and then this unit communicates and powers the indoor unit. So that's what that's what this conduit right here is protecting the high voltage communication lines. Now with this right here, you can see we're going to want a little bit extra line so we can take this cover off. So, so this is good. So we're going to strip this down just a little bit. So what we can do is there's our green wire, which is our ground, and we'll come right near there. So now we have it opened up. And we'll take our ground and we can just pull that out. So if you just scar this with the utility knife and you can just go ahead and follow the, the green wire down and then just pull the green wire out, you can pull this down to this section and then we'll just cut, cut all this right there. This is an awkward angle to work at right here. Now we're going to strip each of these wires and we're going to put it on, let's see, or 16. You could try 14 first, but we're going to put it on 16, which is the gauge size of the wire. Maybe 14 right here, but I'm just going to use 16. 
Doesn't look like we're cutting the wires, so that's good. Now what we wanna do is we're gonna just twist these and we're gonna put these into crimp connectors. We have our crimp connector and our wire, so we can just insert that in and then we're gonna crimp it. So that's that. We're gonna do that for each of the wires. So now we have all three connectors on and for the ground, we're gonna use this style because it's gonna go underneath of that green ground screw. So that's good. We'll remove our ground screw and then we're going to loosen up on these connections. If you remember from our inside unit, red was number one. Black was number two. And white was number three. Got our ground screw. Now we're gonna do our wiring from L1 and L2 over to our disconnect box. So we're gonna have three wires, the ground, L1, and L2. Now we're gonna dry fit the seal tight. We're gonna need to put a connector right here and that's where it's gonna go at. So we're gonna hold that there. So we're gonna to need to cut it right about here. So there's no wire inside of this one, so we can just use our PVC cutters. I'm just gonna rotate as we go through, and then we got it. So that's a nice clean cut, and we'll just slide our nut on, and we'll go ahead and put this on. Now this is be the side that we're pushing the wire into, but it wouldn't matter if we even put this on both sides ahead of time, because we're gonna have such a small piece of seal tight like this. In our flexible conduit, we're gonna be putting our 14 gauge THWN wire, which is our stranded wire. And we're just using 14 gauge because our max fuse is 15 amp. You could use 12 gauge if you have it, whatever. Uh, as long as it's at least above 14 gauge, that's fine. Now I'll put our stranded wire into our seal tight. If this was a long length, then what we would need to do is keep our seal tight straight and push our wire in while somebody holds the other side or you can just tape one side of the seal tight and just kind of pull it straight and fish your wire through. You could also use a wire fish. So now we have both the wires wire in on both sides and now we're gonna go ahead and put the connector on this side. We'll take this cover plate off and we're gonna fish our wires right into the connector We'll keep these, this wire as long as the other one. So we'll cut it right here. It's safe to just cut through all three, but you can do it individually. We're not connected here yet, so everything's safe. Now we're gonna strip these back. Now this has to be in 14 gauge. This is 14 gauge wire. We'll crimp our connectors on now. Now it doesn't matter 
which wire you put in L1 and which one goes in L2. They're both 120 volt wires. Before we connect our electrical lines into the disconnect, we're just going to make sure that the power is off. We're going to check that with our multimeter and that's what we're going to be doing next. Now we're going to remove the disconnect and you see that it just has one screw here holding it in place. And we're going to check for voltage, which the breaker is off right now. We're going to check for AC voltage. And we have nothing. So, so that's good. It's safe to go ahead and work in here. We need to mount our connector right in here. And normally you'll drill both of these out at the same time, but our electrician just left this sealed. And so we still need to drill this out. We know that we have no voltage here, so let's just pull that wire out of the way. We're going to take our unibit here and we're going to drill up. Let's test it out. It's a very odd angle. Maybe we'll go one more. Now we have to strip these wires back and we'll crimp our connectors on before placing these into the disconnect. So we're going to use a flat connector. So now we're going to finish putting this disconnect cover on. And now what we're going to do is we're going to run this piece of PVC up and we're going to mount the drain line right into this piece of PVC. We're also going to put our downspout over top of our lines and we're going to seal the penetration through the wall to make sure that it's waterproof. Down here, as you can see, we have our 245s and we drilled a hole through the floor and this drain line continues down through this deck. So we have this piece of PVC glued down on the bottom and we can actually just shove this piece right in there. It will go in a little bit and then we can just zip tie this piece of PVC right to these two. So I'll take care of that in a minute. We have our, our geocell, which is our exterior sealant. We can also use silicone if need be, but let's go ahead and use this up. So now the next thing, before we cut this down to length, what I want to do is I want to measure right here to get this angle. So we're straight up and down right now. And we see we measure about an inch and a quarter. I don't know if you can see that or not. So that means I need to take an inch and a quarter off down on this side. And so I'll make a cut just like this with my tin snips. So we have our mark right here and we're just going to cut on an angle. And then we're going to cut straight across over to our other mark on the back. That's that. So then we're just going to check to see if this fits. Looks pretty good. So that's it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look down at the bottom here and see where the copper tube starts to bend that and that's where we're going to cut our downspout for length and then we'll cut the back out of the downspout out and then we'll fold this over top. We also need to zip tie our PVC in place uh, but uh, but that's that. So our 
seal tight right here is coming out away from the wall to go towards the unit. So we're gonna cut our downspout and have it right about at this height right here. And we're gonna have to slice the back right in the middle, right up the back so we can open it up. So you know, this is plastic downspout, so it won't uh, cut us as easy as if it was aluminum. If you were working with aluminum, you really have a high chance of accidentally nicking the copper tubing or your hands. So in this case, we're just using our plastic one. So we have our mark right here. Just to make sure that we have a straight line, we can take our square. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a pre-cut around just to make sure it'll be easier to get our final cut afterwards. Now that could have been done with a hacksaw, that's fine, but in this case, just using tin snips. All right, so now we're gonna make sure our line is exact. So that's that. Before we cut the back out, we wanna make sure that we have the right angle, which we do now, and we can take a pair of 90 degree tin snips and it would be a lot easier if we go like this. And we can just take that right along the whole back. So there we go. Now that we have the back all cut out, we're going to place this over top of where the line set is and then we can go ahead and mark where we need to cut the back of this out at Unfortunately, a lot of times you're up on a ladder way up in the air and you can't do this up here. You have to take it down, you know, in order to do it safely. But where I'm located at, I can do it safely in this location. So you don't want to come past the curve. Otherwise, you're going to see that if you look at it from the side. So we're just coming up here. Up on this top right here, we could have just left that intact, but we did cut the, the middle out. It would have been more rigid if we left that intact. Unfortunately, we did not. Gotta work it a little at a time. Now we need to make sure that this is all level. So I can see that this is actually level. Everything is good. We have our, our bubble right in the middle. So we're good to go. I'm gonna go ahead and screw on our stainless steel screws through our PVC clamps and then that'll hold that right on this wall here. We don't want to screw it in all the way, not yet. The 
just a lot of tension. You don't want to keep push, pushing on these clamps, but you can see there's there's plenty of play left. All right, that's pretty good right there. That's good. And then we'll put another clamp down low. So we're ready to put this other clamp in place and our bubble is right in the middle, so we are good. I'll go ahead and screw this one in. If you put too much force on these clamps, it will cause it to break over time. It's actually good right there. We turned our breaker on and we already measured for 240 volts. And now we can go ahead and turn on our disconnect. So you want to make sure that you do that quickly so that you don't get voltage, then not get voltage, then get voltage again. You know, you're not getting a good connection. You want to just go ahead and push that in there real nice and tight right away. Now we're going to go ahead and turn this on. And we have our mode on auto. We'll turn our temperature down and we'll see how the unit runs. So right now we have a return temp of 75 degrees and we have a supply temp of 54. So we have a delta T of 23 degrees. So this system is operating very well. So presently outside it's 82.3 degrees. This system's running, it's very quiet. And our vapor line temperature is at 52.3. Our saturated temperature for R410A on the low side gauge is 48 degrees. So we have 52 minus 48 and we have four degrees of superheat. So this system's running very effectively, very efficiently, and our delta T is good, so our system is good. So you know you can't add refrigerant and check the charge at the same time. You have to just weigh it in based on the line set length, but this is just a, a check of the system's health right now that we're doing. So this system is good. I did also want to point out that mini split systems can run with a very low superheat, so it's different than a standard split system, and that's because it has an accumulator tank inside the outdoor unit. So, and as the system runs, you're going to see this vapor temperature, it's going to lower and also the pressure would lower as the system runs. So presently right now we have about three degrees of superheat, but there's an accumulator tank inside that protects the vapor compressor from any saturated refrigerant entering it. So these systems can run very, very efficiently at a low superheat. So the system's running now. You can hear it's very quiet. That's all good. The only thing that we did not do is we didn't put the stainless steel bolt and nuts in to hold the feet, but we'll take care of that right after this video. But I hope you enjoyed this full installation of a, of a mini split. If you're looking for more HVACR resources, check out our website at eacsilverstech.com. We have articles, we've got quick tips, we've got a Q&A, the podcast, calculators, all kinds of stuff. We've got quizzes there, so check all that out at our website. And if you're looking for any of the tools or the equipment used in this video, we have all of our links down in the description section below. Hope you enjoyed yourself, and we'll see you next time at AZ Service Tech Channel.